G'day everyone, Ben the Spider Seeker here. Now this video has sort of two parts today. Part one is an update on the Six Sydney Funnel Web Rosie, and it felt a little bit depressing, so I decided to throw in part two, which will be an introduction to the menagerie. I was going to do it as a separate video at some point, but I figured it might brighten the tone of this one instead. On to part one then. The update regarding Rosie's condition. So for those who are new here, Rosie is my female at Trax Robustus, the Sydney funnel web. I moved her recently into a larger enclosure after she displayed some concerning behaviours. When I moved her, I noticed her abdomen, or rear end, was a bit misshapen and swollen well beyond what even a gravid spider for her size should be. My hope was simply that she was going into molt or something like that, or just something weird that might recover with a molt, but that proved not to be the case. Her strange behaviour basically continued. She wasn't webbing up or using any of the burrows I provided, other than the display burrow. So this included a few burrows of different sizes and at different angles that I'd poked around the enclosure to see if she was keen on anything else. But she still always went back to the display burrow or she spent her time wandering around the enclosure like she is here. I got a bit more worried when she spent two days straight just continuously wandering around the enclosure after some heavy rain during a storm. This was worrying because some parasites will actually affect a spider's behaviour, driving them to seek out water in order to get basically the best habitat for the parasite to emerge. After the two days she spent wandering, I decided to move her into an enclosure that was a bit easier for me to control. It was basically sphagnum moss with a large rock for it to hide under. But she continued to wander rather than taking shelter under the rock as I would have expected her to. Um, she grew sort of increasingly clumsy and wasn't really able to right herself if she fell over. So I eventually added some more sphagnum moss so she wouldn't fall over so much. I also had a wet end and a dry end. This created a bit of a moisture gradient so she could basically pick what level of moisture she was most comfortable with and sort of hang out in that area of the tank. Through the entire process I basically only disturbed her when I'd noticed she flipped herself upside down. I'd gently basically try and flip her back over, really trying not to lift her because it seemed like placing pressure on her abdomen would be not a wise move. So wherever possible I used this sphagnum moss just to get her to grab onto it and jimmy her over, otherwise some feather-like tongs and a plastic straw just to push her up the right way, so I'd avoid further damage. But while she was upside down I noticed what looked to be a watermark where she'd been sitting in the wettest areas of the enclosure rather than finding an available drier area. This sort of made me a little more worried again. After a couple of days of lethargic wandering, her death curl basically became permanent. So she was still alive, but didn't really do much. She didn't respond when I was flipping her up the right way. And it was at this stage that I decided to bring it to an end and basically use the freezer to end her suffering. Using the freezer as well kills any of the possible parasites she might have contracted or had when I got her. Now, while I'll often describe my spiders and other invertebrates as displays rather than pets, it's kind of hard not to become attached to them. Their personalities after a while just become that bit more apparent, and even though I only had her for about six months, I'm glad I had my experience with her, and I've learnt a lot, especially since her health started deteriorating. As horrible as it was to watch, I've learnt about a lot of the early warning signs I can keep an eye out for and maybe try and manage it a bit sooner next time, if there is ever a next time. Now, one day I'll tell the full story of how I came to have Rosie and what I know and suspect of her history before she joined my menagerie, and of course while she was with me, but that's part of another story. For now, she will be missed from the collection, and I may one day as well investigate why she died, but that probably won't be for a while yet. There's more pressing tasks, largely involving getting the remaining spiders and other invertebrates out of their temporary enclosures and into more permanent and customised setups. 
that does bring me at least to part two of the video, an introduction to the other invertebrates in my menagerie. I'll also have a few feeding clips, and eventually as part of the keeping display side of things, I'll try to develop a few detailed videos about each species or family that I keep and their habits, needs, etc. In the meantime though, an introduction just to provide a, a, probably a little more joy to the video. So let's start off with the ants. First up, my established ant colony. So it's a colony of Mermesia pilosula, eastern race, commonly known as jack jumpers. Now they're pretty feared within Australia. They're known for a painful sting and their ability to jump. They usually jump after threats or prey and to be honest, it's more of a hop, but hey. The main food source for these ones is a tube full of pure honey. They only really need the sugar content to sustain themselves. The protein from the crickets is more for growing the babies and larvae. Now this was my first attempt at a truly custom enclosure. Even before I had the idea of filming the process, building the nest from scratch. I used the same idea later on when I was building the enclosures for the funnel webs. There are sponges enclosed within the nest itself to retain the moisture and they're linked to tubes sticking out from above the nest where I can use a syringe to put water in. This just keeps the humidity level in the nest up. They are also remarkably tidy. They pile up any rubbish, deceased ants or leftover food in one corner for easy cleanup. Or as easy as reaching into a tank full of some of the most painful stinging insects around can be. I usually clean up the rubbish pile about once a month. This month was a bit busy thanks to the development of some winged queens and drones, which is the males, like this one here. They also won't breed in captivity, they need to fly to mate. So it does prevent, well, it provides a bit of a barrier to inbreeding, which comes with its own problems. Next up, I have four Campanortis queens that I found recently. They're commonly called sugar ants or carpenter ants. Strangely enough, three of them just wandered into my office one night and the other one I found in my lounge room. One has made a bit of a mess of the cotton wool, which I've used to balance the moisture in the test tube so you have water on one side and not on the other. Two have raised eggs into pupae, and one has finally this week raised her first worker. This was a bit of a surprise, since I usually leave them alone for most of the time. It also means that she'll be due for an upgrade in her enclosure soon, allowing the worker to gather food, and while the queen continues to raise more workers. This will eventually feature in a future video when I build the new enclosure, or I don't know, put it together. These ants are what's called fully claustral. That means the queens don't actually go out searching for food when they're raising their first few workers. And what that means is until they have a few workers to gather them, test tubes are actually pretty much perfect for raising them. Because when you find them under rocks, that's basically what they're hiding in is a little sort of pocket. It's not that big, but let's move on. Next up we have some centipedes. So I have three centipedes at the moment, none of which are actually fully grown and they're all in small enclosures. This enables them to find their small food fairly efficiently. First up is Scutigera coleoptrata, or house centipede. It's a very fast and it's an introduced species. When I got this one, I bought it off a guy selling it for $3. No one else seemed to want it and it was missing a quarter of its legs. Now I did know they would grow back after a couple of molts and thankfully that was the case. The legs did grow back and it's been very active since. It's got very long antenna as well coming from the head and some very long sensory legs at the back. Now the legs that are sensory no longer actually function as legs, they're just sort of long antenna sticking out the back of them. Next up is a Scolopendra laeta. It's not really any common name I know for this one, but it's another centipede, and it's known for its bright colours. 
The one I have is only young, and it will get bigger. But it has bright blue legs and bright red markings around the head. Eventually, it will move into a nicer permanent enclosure. For now, though, it just eats baby crickets, so I need it in a smaller enclosure so I can actually find them, because they are very small. The last centipede is a young one. I think it's a Cormacephalus species, but I'll have to confirm that as it grows. Now, this one has fairly bright red legs. They have faded a bit, though, as it's grown, but we'll find out when it actually develops into an adult. And again, it's only eating baby crickets, so small enclosures about all I can use for it. Otherwise, it probably just won't find the crickets. Next up, we have the scorpions. Now, I only have two scorpions at the moment, but you wouldn't know. I haven't seen them in a few weeks. One is Uridarchus maticatus, or black rock scorpion. Now, it doesn't actually look black, but that's because of where it's from. It's from the Canberra region, and that kind of makes it one of the alpine forms, although it's not really an alpine area, it's sort of nearly there. And it's also a lighter colour than the standard black rock scorpions. Now, she's about probably five or six centimetres long from nose to tail, so she's probably about fully grown. And she may also be gravid or pregnant. The other one is Uridarchus elongatus, or Flinders Rangers scorpion. It's a much more popular in the hobby, and they're a much larger scorpion when they're fully grown. At the moment, she's about the same size as the black rock scorpion, but she's expected to get much bigger. Both scorpions have a similar setup, with tanks, they're split about 50-50 into the core peat and sand. And I only water in one corner of the tank into the peat side. This creates a fairly complex moisture gradient, but a lot of freedom for the scorpion to choose where it burrows and where it feels most comfortable. Now finally on to the spiders. Some of these spiders are basically pet burrows, not all that different to the scorpions. But I will feature pictures of them during enclosure changes if I haven't managed to get any since. First up is a fairly recent addition to the collection. It's a Latrodectus hasselti, or redback spider. Now I found her looking pretty miserable, underfed and dehydrated. So I decided to see if she'd recover after a couple of good feeds. Now she has recovered and, to my surprise, built an egg sac. The container's only meant to temporarily hold her until I got a chance to see if she'd recover and then release her. So we'll see how that goes, probably next week. Next up is another fairly common household spider, a Bedumna species, or house spider. I think this one's a Bedumna longinqua, or grey house spider. They share quite a few similarities with Bedumna insignis, which is the black house spider. There's a few small differences if you know what you're looking for. She's built her web to include the lid of her temporary enclosure. This makes feeding a bit difficult, but it's achievable without destroying her web, if I'm careful. Now to an enclosure that's more web than spider. It belongs to a spider in the Dipleuridae family, a curtain web spider. The webbing is now incredibly thick and it's molted a couple of times and once fairly recently. And it might soon be big and healthy enough for a new permanent enclosure. Here's a picture of the actual spider and you can see the long spitterettes these spiders are known for. And now of course a feeding video. Prior to molting, she was very active during feeding. Now it takes her a couple of minutes before she gets to it. Next up is a small Stanwellia species of wishbone spider. I have two of these, and they're great burrowers, which means I don't often see them. So sometimes pictures are about the best I can do on the odd occasion they do come out and play. The last of my small spiders are two juvenile funnel webs. One is Hadronici Vesuda, a Blue Mountains funnel web, and the other one is Atrax Robustus, the Sydney funnel web. 
Both spiders are only big enough at the moment to take on the extra small crickets, but they've shown some of the typical funnel web attitude. It's quite likely I'll be upgrading them to the next size of my grow out temporary enclosure quite soon to allow them just that little bit more freedom and where they can burrow effectively and naturally. Again, the enclosures when they are this size should be kept fairly small just to allow them to be able to find their food more effectively. Next up on my funnel web list, she might be a bit familiar to some of you. She's featured in a few videos, Minerva, my large adult hadronic Vasuta, Blue Mountains funnel web. Now, she's featured in a mating video which may have proven successful given the recent modifications to her burrow entrance. For a couple of weeks she closed herself away. Now she's back out though and actively feeding. I'll be keeping an eye on her and provide some updates about the status of any babies I happen to find. This next spider is a bit of a special addition. It was given to me by an arachnologist who was visiting Canberra and was given special permission to collect from an area that's normally off limits. Now in this area there was a whole bunch of tree ferns and those tree ferns have come from an area outside of Canberra. Well and truly outside of Canberra, potentially actually from Queensland. And in the trunks of these tree ferns are some trapdoors, they're Arbonitis species. And they're not native to the area, but possibly came in with the tree ferns. And they've established a fairly dense population around the tree ferns, so it's a bit of a special addition to my menagerie, considering you can't normally collect any specimens from there. In the enclosure, I've provided her with a makeshift tree fern trunk for burrowing into, and plenty of options for burrowing around things. She has of course picked the hardest possible place to get to, right in the corner behind the tree fern. I do plan to build a custom enclosure from scratch for her, hopefully avoiding the mushroom growth issue that I'm currently having. I have found the easiest way to feed her as well is just to place a large number of feeder crickets in the enclosure, but she still rarely comes out to eat them while I'm watching, despite their habit of walking right into her burrow. Finally, on to the two spiders that have been requested more than a couple of times. They're still only small, but they'll get much larger. I have two spiders belonging to the Theraphosidae family. They're known most commonly as tarantulas. Both are Australian species, which surprises some people that we actually have tarantulas. But it is illegal in Australia to import or keep exotic invertebrates, so if you want a tarantula, you've got to have an Australian one. Both are in my opinion though, pretty special in their own right. The first one, and smaller of the two, is a Selenotopus species. It's a sling, which is a juvenile. It's currently housed in a small grow-out container, and it's recently molted successfully, which is a very good sign. It's quite capable of taking on baby crickets, but it's not usually an active feeder. My second one though, is larger, and it's usually pretty active in feeding. It also has recently had a successful molt, which is again another good sign. It's known in the species as a Phlogius goliath, not to be confused with Theraphosa blondi, the Brazilian goliath, because that one's about twice the size. Currently it goes by the species name Selenocosmia crassipes, or crassops, depending how you want to say it. It sometimes takes its time coming out to feed, but it'll always do it. It has a leg span of about 6 centimetres which is so far my second largest spider behind the Minerva the Blue Mountains funnel web. It will grow though and become my biggest by a mile at a 15 centimeter leg span. In the enclosure, I provided it two options for its bark shelters. One small one off to the side and a large central one. Both are slightly buried into the mound that's covered in sphagnum moss and it's picked the smaller one for its home. It has of course filled half the enclosure in webbing and it's dug through the small hill to create a second entrance. I make use of a small cleaning insect known as springtails in this enclosure to manage any mould and clean up the leftovers as well. They can be seen floating when I fill their water dish. Springtails are pretty easy to look after. They only really need water, charcoal and mould. And a lot of people will tell you just how easy it is to grow mould. 
to grow the mould in the actual springtail box. Once a month or so, I'll put in some grains of rice. This grows the mould, and that feeds the springtails. This gives me a fairly steady population to use as a cleanup crew for my enclosures. So that about wraps it up for the sad update about Rosie, the Sydney funnel web, and I've managed to introduce at least the vast majority of my menagerie. I hope you've enjoyed seeing them as much as I do on a regular basis. I'll be sure to do some more detailed videos about them a bit later, especially as I get around to building the more permanent enclosures for them. If you like this sort of thing, and you're keen, feel free to like, share, subscribe and whatnot. Otherwise, it, it, either way. For now, I've been Ben the Spider Seeker, and you've been great. Catch you next time.